Yenan, um, is your microphone on? Can, can we hear you? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Thanks okay. a lot. Okay, yes. I think then we should should get started. Yeah, we have uh, Yenan Lee talking about the uh, uh, traditional version of, of Hammerspawn. Please. Okay, thank you, Mario. Um, and uh, thanks everybody for attending. Um, today, uh, basically, I want to talk something about zero quantum information theory. Um, so this is a joint work with Li Gao, who uh, is in the audience from University of Houston, and also with Sandra Gribling, who is at uh, ELIF in Paris. Okay, so I want to start with a gentle introduction about uh, classical zero information theory. So this was first introduced by Shannon in 1950s. So the goal of this um, communication task is to send classical information from uh, a sender Alice to Bob through some classical channel N. Um, and uh, we require Bob to decode all this information uh, with the railroad. Okay, so Shannon introduced this problem and uh, find a beautiful combinatorial characterizations for this problem. So basically he assigned each classical channel N a confusability graph. So how to construct this confusability graph? You take all the input symbols x1 to x5 as the vertices of the graph. And I'm going to put an edge between two input symbols if they can be confused by this channel. For example, if I'm having x1 and x2 to be adjacent because both of x1 and x2 has some probability to be mapped to y2. Okay, so in this case, they can be confused. So I put an edge here and you can do this uh, for all possible input symbols, okay? And once we have this uh, transformation from channel to graph, it's not so hard to see that uh, if we have a zero error encoding in this classical channel, then we actually find an independent set in the confusability graph, okay? So the independent set basically means a subset of vertices which are pairwisely uh, non-adjacent. And uh, we are always caring about what is the maximum integer, what is the maximum number of the error messages one can send through a classical channel, then basically this corresponding to the independence number of, of the confusability graph, R of a GN. Okay, so this is uh, the story about uh, the one shoot setting. And of course we can consider, uh, we can consider using the channel many times in parallel. Um, we consider block code of length K, and uh, we consider this uh, you know, parallel use of the channels as a whole channel, and we can draw the computability graph of the corresponding large channel. So for example, I take two pentagon channels, and I'm using them together, uh, like in, in parallel. Uh, now I have a graph with 25 vertices. So every, every point is a vertex, and I have this adjacency relations based on the, the channel structure. Okay. And uh, this graph is actually obtained by taking the strong graph product of the two pentagons. So this is uh, the classic original channel and the corresponding confusability graph is pentagon. So now I kind of know like, how to construct um, you know, the, the corresponding graphs when you take a block code of length K, it will corresponding to the confusability graph of GN to the K's strong graph product power. Okay, so now we have known what 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 is the one shoot case, and what uh, we know how to you know how to do large block lens. So the natural quantity we are going to consider is the so called zero error capacity of a channel or the channel capacity of a graph. So just take a regularization of the independence number. So this is uh, basically gives you a, a formula to compute the zero error capacity. So this capacity formula looks not exactly the same as in the vanishing case where you only need to compute uh, the mutual information, uh, which is kind of like a single letter formula. But now you have to, some, somehow you have to involve like tensor product here. So this is uh, somehow the difficulty to estimate channel capacity. And this is uh, what people have been done in the past, past 50 years is to provide uh, good upper bounds or good estimates to the channel capacities of classical channels or graphs. And in recent years, uh, there's a beautiful theory called the symptotic spectrum of graphs, which was introduced to study channel capacity. And I want to mention a little bit here. So the symptotic spectrum of a graphs um, is a set of functions which maps graphs to non-negative numbers and satisfies some very good properties. For example, I want this phi, uh, 
phi acting on one vertex graph equals to one. This one I call normalization. Okay. Um, I also want my function to be multiple and uh, additive with respect to this strong graph product and the disjoint union. Okay. Uh, importantly, I also want my function to be monotone in the sense that I want phi g smaller than phi h. If I can find a graph homomorphism from the complement graph of G to the complement graph of H, okay. The reason to have this uh, a little bit weird uh, monotonicity condition is because, together with these four properties, we can actually show that every such function phi is an is an upper bound on the Shannon capacity. So if you uh, if you take a simple um, if if you check uh, it's easy to check that uh, with condition one, three, and four. You can show that phi is a one shoot upper bound, and with the multiplicativity, it's a, both an upper bound in the, for the asymptotic quantities. Okay, so now basically, this asymptotic spectrum of graphs provide a set of uh, up, good upper bounds for the Shannon capacities. But what is more surprising and interesting is it actually gives you everything. So uh, it was proved by my previous colleague and uh, collaborator, Yeron Zaldan. He shows that the Shannon capacity is exactly given by the minimization over elements in the asymptotic spectrum of graphs. So this somehow gives you a, um, a, a kind of like a single letter formula. Besides that, uh, for different graph G, you may get different uh, uh, phi as uh, to, to achieve the minimum. Okay. Um, so basically, if we want to study Shannon capacities now, uh, um, uh, another promising direction to study Shannon capacity is to also study, you know, the set of uh, asymptotic spectrum of graphs. But of course, this seems to be a very hard problem. But at least we can find some uh, like uh, like elements in the asymptotic spectrum of graphs. And uh, interestingly, um, many famous upper bound on the Shannon capacity belongs to this set. This includes the celebrated Lovasita function, the fractional Hammers bound, which I've Going to introduce you in uh, in a few slides, and the projective rank and the fractional key cover number. Okay, so all of them are a good upper bound on Shannon capacities, and uh, all of them belongs to the symptotic spectrum of graphs. Okay, so the goal of this talk is to increase our understanding of a symptotic spectrum of graphs um, through a quantum lens. Okay, so I will first tell you how to how to define this quantum versions of these quantities, including independence numbers and Shannon capacities and the asymptotic spectrum of graphs. And I want to characterize sh quantum Shannon capacities in terms of these quantum asymptotic spectra. And once I have these quantum versions, um, I'm going to find the new elements in the asymptotic spectrum of graphs. Uh, the first one is tracial rank, introduced by Powers et al. in 2016. And the second one is the tracial hammers bound, which was introduced by my collaborators and myself. And the implication of our result is we somehow provide a new upper bound on the Shannon capacity, which is called tracial hammers bound. And this bound is sometimes better than Lova Sita function. And more importantly, we gave a unified description for many spectral points. And uh, we hope that uh, this can be benefit uh, uh, to, to our understanding of a symptotic spectrum of graphs, okay? So now let me, um, let me give you a brief introduction about how to define this uh, graph parameters in terms of uh, using, quantum, using quantum information, okay? So I want to start with a non-local game for graph homomorphism. So um, I have two players, Alice and Bob, and they know two graphs, G and H, and uh, they can share some non-local correlations. And now the referee sends uh, two, two vertices um, uh, of graph G as, as the questions, and Alice and Bob should return like two vertices of, uh, of, of H as answers. The winning, condition of, uh, the winning condition of this game is if Alice and Bob receives the same vertices, then sh they should also respond to the same vertices. And if, if they receive adjacent vertices, then they should also re respond adjacent vertices. So this is exactly how you mimic the conditions for graph homomorphisms using non-local games. And instead of talking about uh, 
the exact uh, success probabilities, we are more caring about uh, for which two graphs G and H does there exist a perfect strategy for this non-local game, okay? So one simple case is uh, Alice and Bob could only share some local randomness. And in this case, the existence of perfect strategy for this for this graph homomorphism game corresponding to the existence of a graph homomorphism from graph G to H, okay? So this leads us to, to the following natural definitions. I can consider that Alice and Bob to share some entangled state, and this can be either in a tensor product model or in commuting co operator model. And uh, I'm, I'm going to define like uh, the quantum homomorphism and commuting quantum homomorphism by the existence of perfect strategies for this, uh, for this non-local games with this uh, corresponding uh, uh, non-local uh, correlations, okay? So this is a natural definition and uh, it's not hard to see that uh, if I have a graph homomorphism, then I also have a quantum graph homomorphism, then I also have a commuting quantum graph homomorphism because uh, local randomness can be uh, mimicked by entanglement and entanglement can be also mimicked by like um, in the uh, infinite dimensional uh, quantum entanglement, okay? So once I have uh, this uh, quantum versions of homomorphisms, I can define many graph parameters, including independence numbers. So now I'm taking a graph G and I'm taking a variable T, which represents Q or QC. So I'm defining T independence number as alpha T by taking the maximum integer D such that you can find a T homo graph homomorphism from the D vertex complete graph to the complement graph of G. So if you just, uh, uh, ignore this T, this gives you an alternative definition for the independence number. And of course, this uh, quantum versions of independence number also admits some uh, information theoretic characterizations. So for alpha Q of G, this characterizes the largest zero encoding of classical channel assisted by maximally entangled state and projective measurement. Okay. And I want to mention that this is uh, like entanglement assisted zero communication with a specific uh, encoding scheme. So in the most general case, I, we have alpha star of G, which uh, characterized the largest zero encoding assisted by arbitrary entanglement and arbitrary measurement. So the alpha Q here we are studied is actually a lower bound of alpha star. But anyway, we can still like uh, follow the, uh, the same story to define the so-called T channel capacity, which is the regularization of alpha T. And we can also define the T asymptotic spectrum of graphs by just uh, replacing the monotonicity results uh, using, using this uh, T graph quantum graph, uh, T graph homomorphisms. And because we have previously mentioned that there is uh, some uh, like uh, implications between uh, between this graph homomorphisms. We know that XQC is a subset of XQ, and it's a subset of X. Okay. And not so surprisingly, we can still follow the proof technique of uh, Euron to show that if I'm taking this variable T to be either Q or QC, I have the capital C T equals to the minimization over elements in the corresponding T asymptotic spectrum of graphs, okay? So the next step is to examine whether there is, uh, which elements belongs to XQ and XQC, okay? In our previous work, we showed that uh, the Lova Sita function belongs to XQ, the projective rank also belongs to XQ, and the fractional Hammers bond over complex numbers also belongs to XQ. And uh, we believe there are many other elements, but uh, we have not found anything yet, okay? But for elements in XQC, the things becomes a little bit tricky. So what we only know is the Lova Sita function belongs to XQC, okay? And, our, uh, and in this talk, I'm going to show you that actually the tracial rank and tracial Hammers bond also belongs to XQC and both of this two graph parameters can be thinking of as infinite dimensional generalizations of projective rank and the fractional hammer spot, okay? And uh, in the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus on the treasure of hammer spot and mention only a little bit about treasure rank, okay? So now let me first present you how to define an infinite 
dimensional version of uh, of of Hammerspawn. So before that, let's record how to define Hammerspawn itself. Okay. So this involves a definition about what so called D over R subspace representation of a graph. So this was introduced by many people, and we are going to take uh, a geometric uh, uh, a geometric definition introduced by Lex Schreiber. So here is uh, here we are going to assign each vertex of the graph a dimension R subspace in a D dimensional Hilbert space. Okay, SI is a subspace of uh, of CD, and SI has dimension R. And I want the, this SI to be satisfy some uh, properties. This is uh, basically SI intersect with the span of all possible SJ, where J is non adjacent to I, is trivial. Okay. And then I'm going. Uh, then the Hammer's bond of a graph is defined by taking the minimum integer d such that you can find a d over one subspace representation. So in the Hammer's bond, you only want uh, one-dimensional subspace assignment. And in the most general fractional Hammer's bond, you are going to take the infimum of d over r such that you can find a d over r subspace representation. Okay. So this is how you define like. Um, Hammerspawn and fractional Hammerspawn. And now I want to generalize this definition to infinite dimensional setting. But it seems that uh, it's not so convenient to talk about the dimensions of subspace because infinite dimensional Hilbert space could have uh, infinite dimensional subspaces. Okay? So instead of doing that, I'm going to consider the projection onto the Hilbert space. Okay? So for every SI, I'm going to consider the projection PI onto SI. And also, this d over r can be written as a purely uh, like uh, value with respect to pi. So d over r is d over the dimension of si. And if I put d to the denominator, then this is exactly the normalized trace of the projection pi. So this d over r is basically the, the inverse of the normalized trace of pi. And we also need to deal with uh, this condition, which is uh, an intersection condition. And uh, for notation-wise, for two projections, P and Q, I'm using P vach Q to represent the projection onto the closed the subspace of range P intersect with range Q, okay? And P V Q is the projection onto the closed the subspace of the closure of the span of range P plus range Q, okay? So now I can replace this uh, intersection and uh, this uh, this span condition by this wedge and v operation. So now I'm ready to define the so-called lambda trivial subspace representation of a graph G, which involves a von Neumann algebra M with a trivial state tau, such that you can find projections pi in this von Neumann algebra, satisfying that tau of pi is one over lambda. And this pi wedged with this big projection is zero, and I'm defining tracial Hammer's bond as the infimum of over all possible lambda tracial subspace representation. Okay, and uh, basically, as I have uh, mentioned in this notation case, um, this weird um, projection equality can actually be trans translated as uh, like taking the range of pi and it intersect with the closure of uh, the span of range pj where j is non adjacent to i is trivial so this condition it is a natural infinite dimensional generalizations of the subspace intersection condition and one thing i also want to mention is this von neumann algebra is somewhat necessary here uh, because if you are familiar with non-local games, you know that most in most of the case we are talking about C-star algebras, but here we have to use Volnoma algebras. Because one simple reason is this this veg and V operations are actually closed in this Volnoma algebra. Okay? So this is the definition of trivial Hammer's bond. And with this definition, we can prove our main results. So we show that for any graphs G and H. This trivial Hammer's bound satisfy all these four properties we want um, as an element in the symptotic spectrum of graphs. And in that case, we, we know that alpha QC is upper bounded by theta QC and upper bounded by the trivial Hammer's bound. And we know that trivial Hammer's bound is an element in XQC. Okay? 
So this is our first main result. And the second main result is now we are curious about uh, whether this new graph parameters uh, gives you a better upper bound on shannon capacity or not. So let's first compare with Lovacita and we show this uh, actually these two parameters are incomparable. So you can find a graph G such that tracial Hammers bond is strictly smaller than Lovacita of G and the tracial Hammers bond of C5 is uh, strictly larger than Lovacita of C5. Okay. And uh, another thing you you want to uh, you want to check is whether tracial Hammers bond is equals to fractional Hammers bond or not. And uh, we somehow couldn't prove uh, a separation here, but what we can show is if the coins embedding conjecture is true, then they are the same. So of course now we know that the coins embedding conjecture is false with high probability. But we would like to say that if we can separate these two things, then somehow we provide an alternate, probably an alternative proof to disprove the coins embedding conjecture. Okay. And the last property I want to mention is uh, um, a unified description for other elements in X. So basically, if we replace this uh, weird intersection condition by orthogonality, then I'm going to recover the tracial rank of G. And if we restrict to finite dimension of Noma algebra, then I recover the fractional Hammers bound. And if we, I restrict it to commutativity, a uh, com commutative for Noma algebra, then I get the fractional key cover number. Okay. And I also want to talk a little bit about the main techniques we are used. Um, I will talk. Uh, I will mention two here. The first one is an infinite dimensional generalizations of the following. So I'm taking two subspaces of a finite dimensional Hilbert space. Take S and T to be to be two subspaces, and then the dimension of S plus dimension of T can be computed by compute the dimension of S plus T and the dimension of S intersect with T. So this is basically linear algebra. Now what happens in the infinite dimensional setting? Now I'm taking a Von Neumann algebra M and I'm taking two projections in the Von Neumann algebra and I also have a normal trace on this Von Neumann algebra. Now what we can prove is the tau of P plus tau of Q can be equivalently computed by tau of PVQ plus tau of P vetch Q. Okay? So this proof basically used the representation theorem of the universal sister algebra generated by two projections. Okay, this is uh, somehow widely used uh, now in non-local games. And the second technique we used is basically provide lots of uh, equivalent formulations for tracial hammer spawn. And I want to specifically mention one here. So this is the original tracial hammer spawn defined in terms of a lambda tracial subspace representation. We can also define tracial hammer spawn in terms of a lambda tracial projection representation by replacing this wedge condition by this norm condition. So I want the norm of PI times this big projection to be zero. So this is a relaxation of the tracial subspace representation because for projections P and Q, the, the norm of PQ is zero implies P, the P batch Q is zero. And the re reverse part only holds when H is finite dimensional. So this is uh, maybe a, a more general definition for tracial Hammers bond and we use this definition to prove super multiplicativity and additivity. And uh, basically, we show these two definitions are exactly the same. Okay. So let me quickly summarize this talk. So in this talk, I'm talking about uh, independence numbers and uh, channel capacities of the quantum setting. And uh, uh, we study them through the lens of asymptotic spectrum of graphs, and we introduce uh, like two new elements in the asymptotic spectrum of graphs. Uh, one of them is um, is better is a better upper bound on theta QC. Okay, and uh, we provide unified descriptions for other elements in X, and uh, we put a code in new here. Um, because um, because the tracial Hammers bond and the fractional Hammers bond, we cannot really separate them because uh, because of this coins embedding conjecture stuff, okay? And I left the two open questions here. The first one is whether we can find SDP approximations for tracial Hammers bond and fractional Hammers bond. The reason we ask this question is because all the other elements can be computed or approximated by SDPs. And the second question is uh, whether these two new upper bond on alpha Q 
is comparable with alpha star. Okay, I think I will stop here and uh, thank you all for your attention. Thanks a lot, Yenan. Uh, very good timing. <laughs> no, thanks for, for the nice talk. Um, do we have questions? Let me check the chat and the Slack. Anyone? I don't see any questions, but please speak up. Anyone has a question? No, I don't see anything. So this is, oh, wait. Oh, good. Um, so this is not necessarily uh, the main one of my uh, the topics that I would know about. But so so you said there's this uh, the asymptotic spectrum right that, that can generate upper bounds. So is there any hope to create new elements in the spectrum, uh, or is uh, this? Yeah, I think there's a way to create new elements um, by well, there's a um, there's a very complicated mathematical way to combine like two elements to produce a better one. So so for example, you can take I a see. Fraction, fractional Hammerspawn and Lovacita and put them into a very complicated mathematical box and then you get a new element. And this new element is incomparable with both Lovacita and uh, and um, and Hammerspawn. So this construction exists but uh, I, I, I'm not so sure whether you can write down, you know, the, the explicit formula for this new element. Yeah. So then it might not be very like, well, I guess, efficiently computable or whatever, even to have it for it to have an explicit form. I see. Yeah, I think everything here, uh, the only efficient computable one is the Lovacita. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Um, any questions? came up still or good I guess we yeah, have well thanks again you know